August 16th of 1980, the Australian family, the Chamberlains, went on a camping trip to Uluru, formerly known as Ayers Rock, the famously titanic sandstone rock formation on Australia's Northern Territory. Designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Uluru is sacred to the Anawu people and is the site of numerous freshwater springs, watering holes, rock caves, and ancient Aboriginal paintings. And naturally, due to the immense natural beauty of the area, Uluru has been a popular tourist destination for almost a hundred years. The Chamberlain's first day and night camping in Uluru were relatively uneventful, and the family passed the time relaxing at their campsite while their children played atop the red, sandy earth. Keeping an eye on seven- and four-year-old sons Aiden and Regan proved to be a handful, as their parents had welcomed their daughter Azaria into the world just two months prior. Some might argue that it was a little too soon after labor to go on a camping trip, but the pregnancy had been a hard one, and both Lindy and Michael Chamberlain were desperately in need of some rest and relaxation. But the trip would ultimately prove to be anything but relaxing, and would in fact turn out to be every parent's worst nightmare. According to both Michael and Lindy Chamberlain, they had first spotted a pack of dingoes shortly after they had made camp on August 16th. A dingo is a kind of Australian wild dog, one with a remarkably similar appearance to contemporary domesticated dogs. But that's where the similarities to our familiar furry friend ends, as dingoes are said to be considerably faster, stronger, and much more ferocious than domesticated canines. It became apparent that the dingoes could smell the family's food cooking away on a small camping stove, and slowly but surely they edged closer and closer to the camp. At first, the closer encounter with such wild creatures thrilled the Chamberlains, with Michael even tossing them a few sandwich crusts for them to feed on. Yet unbeknownst to him, that would prove to be a huge mistake. For the previous two years, Uluru Chief Ranger Derek Roth had been writing to the local government to warn them of an uptick in the region's dingo population. Due to an abundance of natural prey, the years leading up to 1980 saw an explosion in the number of dingo packs that roamed the region. Increased numbers caused a strain on the dingo's natural sources of prey, and soon more and more packs were finding themselves with considerably less to eat. As a result, dingo packs were becoming increasingly aggressive, approaching and sometimes biting people, and Derek Roth warned that it wasn't long before something terrible occurred. Which is why when Michael Chamberlain threw those crusts, and the dingoes identified the family as a source of potential food, he'd inadvertently put his family in serious danger. Then, around 8pm, Michael and Lindy put their children to bed and returned to the campfire to get a moment alone together. Sometime later, the couple heard something moving around the tent where their children were sleeping. Assuming it was just one of them rolling around in their sleep, they didn't seem to think much of it. But when they heard one of their young sons cry out in terror, the couple leapt into action. They arrived at the tent, finding that each of their young sons were terrified, but otherwise unharmed. Azaria, however, was nowhere to be seen. The Chamberlains asked their sons where Azaria was, but they didn't have an answer. Each had been asleep, and they were awoken by some rustling at the mouth of the tent, but it was far too dark and far too sudden for them to work out exactly what it was. The two parents searched frantically around the nearby area, but not a trace of their daughter could be found. And the sad truth was that neither Michael nor Lindy would ever see their baby girl again. But that's not what makes this abduction story so horrifying, as the pain and suffering of the family didn't end with the abduction of their daughter. And for Lindy in particular things were about to get unimaginably worse. As you might imagine, police were called in and the campsite was blocked off before forensic examiners poured over the tents and surrounding area. They noted animal prints on the floor of the tent, and a park ranger found what he believed to be dingo tracks leading from the tent and off in the direction of some rocks near the base of Uluru. Police followed the faint trail, and to their horror, found blood-stained clothes belonging to the two-month-old Azaria. 
The initial inquest into Cesaria's disappearance was opened in Alice Springs on December 18th of 1980. Two days later, in the first ever live broadcast of Australian court proceedings, Magistrate Dennis Barrett ruled that the most likely explanation for the child's disappearance was a dingo attack. However, Barrett had a rather chilling addendum to his statement, adding that following the initial dingo attack, the body of Azaria was taken from the possession of the dingo and disposed of by an unknown method, by a person or persons, name unknown. This is based on the fact that there seemed to be evidence suggesting that someone had actually undone some buttons at some point after Azaria had been taken. This was a horrifying enough revelation from the parent of any missing child, but the police's conclusions turned a living nightmare into marching through hell when they accused Lindy Chamberlain of murdering her own child. Northern Territory police and prosecutors had always suspected Lindy's involvement in the disappearance of her own daughter, and even after the investigation was officially concluded, officers continued to work the case. This led to a second inquest in September of 1981. Based on ultraviolet photographs of Azaria's jumpsuit, medical experts alleged that there was a tiny cut around the neck of the baby's jumpsuit recovered from the surrounding bush. Essentially, they were implying that someone had cut a two-month-old baby's throat, that someone was evil enough to murder young Azaria Chamberlain. And in their view, that person was her own mother. We can only imagine the horror of the moment Lindy was accused of killing her own tiny baby. The universe had somehow found the one solitary way of compounding the mind-breaking grief she was experiencing. It was like a sick cosmic joke and she no doubt told herself that it couldn't be happening. Only it was. It was reality. Lindy was about to stand trial for the murder of her own newborn baby. At her trial, the state prosecution had alleged that at some point, and with her husband's consent, Lindy had gotten up from the campfire and walked over to the tent in which her children slept. She then carried a sleeping Azaria to their family's car, changed into a pair of tracksuit pants that she intended to subsequently dispose of, then used a pair of scissors to cut her two-month-old daughter's throat. Then, according to prosecuting attorneys, Lindy held her baby upside down by the ankle and waited for it to bleed to death. Expert witnesses claimed that there was no evidence of arterial bleeding from the jumpsuit bloodstains, and it would take up to 20 minutes for Azaria to die if her mother had cut her jugular vein and not her aorta. Allegedly, when Lindy was sure that Azaria was dead, she hid the body of her young daughter in a camera case and tried not only to clean up any blood that had gotten on the car, but also to collect enough of it to smear on the interior of the children's tent to simulate some kind of animal attack. The prosecution said she did all that without ever attracting the attention of any other camper, and that this all went unnoticed during the first inquest due to a combination of luck, careful concealment, and painstaking planning on the Chamberlain's part. Lindsay's defense lawyer focused on eyewitness statements which detailed the dingoes that were in the area on the night of August 17th. It also pointed out that many of the tests used by the prosecution to prove that Azaria's blood was in the car were faulty and showed that mucus and chocolate milkshakes also tested positive for blood using these same techniques. The defense also called on a man named Les Harris, who at the time had been conducting research into the Australian dingo population for well over 10 years. It was him that testified that a dingo's carnassial teeth can shear through material as tough as motor vehicle seatbelts, they also cited an example of a captive female dingo removing a bundle of meat from its wrapping paper and leaving the paper intact. To the Chamberlains, it seemed like a foregone conclusion. There was an airtight explanation for their daughter's disappearance. A tragic one, but surely no jury would favor the idea of a mother murdering her baby daughter over the increasing encroachment of aggressive predatory animals. But they did. On October 29th of 1982, a jury of her peers found Lindy Chamberlain guilty of the murder of her own baby girl, with the judge then handing down a sentence of life imprisonment. 
Her husband Michael was found guilty as an accessory after the fact and was given an 18-month suspended prison sentence. As she was dragged away, a horrified Lindy Chamberlain loudly protested her innocence, apparently screaming out, a dingo ate my baby, before bailiffs managed to escort her from court. I think it's objectively difficult to imagine how horrendous it would be to lose a child, only then to be convicted of that child's murder. In the prison she was held in, Lindy found she was the subject of a phenomenal amount of hatred. To her fellow inmates, she was a child killer, the lowest of the low. Those that had it in them to kill children, to kill babies, didn't deserve to live themselves, and as a result, Lindy had to be held in a special wing of the prison reserved normally for those in protective custody. She was in a unit with actual child killers, predators and abusers that looked at her and thought, one of us. The trauma of that no doubt played a part in Lindy repeatedly lodging appeals, two of which were quashed by both the federal and high courts of Australia. For almost six long years, Lindy remained in prison trying to keep it together, trying to fight on. But there came a time where she believed that her luck had run out and that she was doomed to spend the rest of her life in prison for something she hadn't done, something she'd never even think about doing. It's believed that her outlook became so bleak that she considered taking her own life. But every time, thoughts of Michael and her two young sons kept her from entertaining such masochistic ideas. And it's a good job too because in early 1986, an unforeseen event would once again turn the media spotlight back onto the disappearance of Azaria Chamberlain. And in the bizarre twist of fate, justice would bloom out of yet another untimely death. David Brett had a passion for climbing, and sometime in the mid-1980s, David decided he'd combine his love of mountaineering with an Australian vacation to a bird's-eye view of the land down under. But as it would turn out, David's attempt to climb Uluru would be the last thing he'd ever do, as he tragically fell to his death during a routine climb in early 1986. Because of the vast size of the rock and the scrubby nature of the surrounding terrain, it was eight days before Brett's remains were discovered, lying below the bluff where he had lost his footing. His body showed evidence of having been picked over by some kind of scavenger, and this is how search and rescue operators found the dingo lair just meters away from David's body. To ensure the dingoes hadn't dragged any of David's body parts into their cave with them, Operators scoured the cave for potential remains and came across something stunning. It was a tiny baby-sized matinee jacket, one that had belonged to none other than Azaria Chamberlain. The chief minister of the Northern Territory ordered Lindy Chamberlain's immediate release and reopened the investigation into Azaria's disappearance. Then, on September 15th of 1988, the Northern Territory Court of Criminal Appeals unanimously overturned all convictions against Lindy and Michael Chamberlain, and they were officially declared not guilty of their daughter's murder. Two years later, the Chamberlains were awarded $1.3 million in compensation for wrongful imprisonment, a sum that covered less than one-third of their legal expenses. They were outraged. They wanted an apology. They wanted justice but what the Australian government chose to give them was a slap in the face. It took until February of 2012 for the Northern Territory Coroner, Elizabeth Morris, to offer an official apology for the injustice the Chamberlains had faced. But by then, it was too little too late, and the horror of what the family endured could never be erased or forgotten. But perhaps what's more abstractly horrifying about the accusation of Lindy Chamberlain was just how willing the general public were to believe that she'd killed her baby. By all accounts, the media's representation of the case was highly polarizing, and the case is now used as an example of how media and bias can adversely affect a trial. There have been many accounts of people spreading fanciful rumors or making sick jokes about the child's disappearance, and how newspapers were keen to sell a story of an evil, murderous mother simply because it sold more copies. People also judged Lindy on the way in which she grieved, 
with some saying her media appearances made her look cold and unsympathetic. They said she didn't cry enough, that she didn't seem broken enough, and as a result, people chose not to believe her. Much was made of the Chamberlain's Seventh-day Adventist religion, including false allegations that the church was actually a cult that killed infants as a part of a bizarre religious ceremony. At one point, police received an anonymous tip from a man who claimed to be a close associate of the Chamberlain's and that Azaria was a name that meant sacrifice in the wilderness in some ancient satanic language. According to the Chamberlain's, Azaria actually means blessed by God, and by all accounts, the man was nothing more than a lunatic. But it goes to show just how willing people were to paint Lindy as some kind of witch. And much like the witches of Salem, Massachusetts, Lindy was publicly sacrificed to satisfy some primal craving for justice. Like it couldn't have been an accident, it had to have been someone's fault. Someone had to be sacrificed. Azaria's death became such a worldwide phenomenon that it's been referenced in all kinds of media, including The Simpsons and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. In fact, you probably heard the phrase, Dingoes ate my baby, way before you even knew what a dingo was, and there's a good reason for that. It's because the world is a big, scary place, and it's still full of monsters. And the idea that even in 1980, nature could still reach out and hurt us, so seemingly randomly, for many, that was a bitter pill to swallow. Born on January 17th of 1991, Lauren Spear was the daughter of Charlene and Robert, an accountancy couple from Scarsdale, New York. After graduating from Edgemont High School in 2009, Lauren enrolled at Indiana University. She was an active and good-natured young student and volunteered for many charitable causes. For example, she had spent the previous spring break planting trees in Israel on behalf of the Jewish National Fund, combining her two passions of travel and public service. As you can imagine, Lauren's attitude made her a very popular young woman, and her circle of friends seems to have been a consistent and positive one. You see, Lauren had met her college boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, as well as her best friend, Jay Rosenbaum, during a summer camp in the hillside town of Honesdale, PA, and a handful of her other close friends at Indiana University had also attended the summer camp. The point is, it seemed that Lauren was part of a tight-knit unit of friends who both loved and trusted one another, which makes it all the more alarming when we learn what happened to her. On the night of Thursday, June 2nd, 2011, Lauren and her friends visited the nearby Kilroy Sports Bar. In an effort to save on what little cash they had, Lauren and her friends partook in what's known as pre-gaming, where people drink store-bought alcohol before going out to a bar or club. The group of friends were also notorious for only venturing out into the night during the wee small hours. Kilroy's also catered to this kind of crowd, keeping their bar open until 4 in the morning, and CCTV footage from that night doesn't show Lauren and her friends arriving until about 1.46 a.m. For the first 45 minutes or so, everything appears relatively normal. Lauren and her friends have drinks, they dance, they play pool, everything you might expect from a group of college kids soaking up the nightlife. But then, around 2.27 in the morning, Lauren's behavior takes a somewhat bizarre turn. It's around then that Lauren gets up and walks out of the bar, leaving her cell phone on the bar top and her shoes on the floor near her seat. After exiting Kilroy's, she is then quickly followed by a friend named Corey Rossman. Rossman seems confused as to why Lauren left her things behind, but seems only too happy to follow her back to her apartment complex. At exactly 2.30 a.m., Corey and Lauren enter the small wood plaza apartments complex that Laura called home. It's here they remain for exactly 28 minutes before CCTV once again captures them leaving the apartment complex. Only instead of walking back to the bar, where Lauren's phone and shoes are still sitting there, Lauren and Corey walk down an alleyway that connects College Avenue and Morton Street. 
the same alley where Lauren's purse and apartment keys would be found the following day. CCTV footage then catches Lauren and Corey arriving at the latter's apartment at around 3 in the morning. This footage shows Lauren to be a little worse for wear, but Corey Rossman is somehow absolutely trashed by this point. Corey's roommate, Michael Beth, later said that he had to clean up a puddle of vomit that Corey left in the stairwell that same night, and that Corey was so drunk that he had to be put to bed. Michael added that once this was done, he then tried to persuade Lauren to sleep over for her own safety. However, Lauren insisted that she wanted to return to her own apartment, probably citing her need to find her missing possessions. And so at 3.30 a.m., Michael Beth called Lauren's friend Jay Rosenbaum, telling him he needed to come take care of her. We can only assume he answered in the affirmative because a short while later, Lauren shows up at Jay's apartment with a rather large bruise under her eye. Jay later said that he was worried about the injury, but after Lauren told him she didn't know how she obtained the bruise, Jay assumed she'd gotten it during a drunken fall from earlier in the evening. However, of all the CCTV footage we have of Lauren and her friends, there are no recorded incidents of falling, and no recorded incidences of people fussing over her eye, which we could then use to estimate the time and place of such an injury. By 4.30 a.m., Lauren hasn't had an alcoholic drink in over two hours, and is no doubt beginning to sober up. Granted, she wouldn't have been in the best condition of her life, but she is no doubt realizing that she's lost pretty much everything she brought out with her, being her phone, keys, shoes, and purse. In light of this, we can understand why Lauren was reluctant to sleep it off when she could actively go about recovering some of her lost items. Lauren then left Jay Rosenbaum's apartment at around 4.30 that morning, last being sighted on CCTV footage headed south from the intersection of 11th Street and College Avenue. Several hours later, Lauren's boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, sent her a text which she failed to reply to, and when reply did finally roll in, it was from an employee of Kilroy's sports bar, saying Lauren had left her phone there overnight. Not long after, given he had zero means of getting in touch with her, no one had seen her that morning. Jesse contacted the local campus police to report Lauren missing. After three weeks of fruitless search, August of 2011 saw local police and FBI agents undertake a week-long search of the nearby Sycamore Ridge landfill site. Needless to say, it wasn't looking good for Lauren, as cops were evidently looking for a body, or more accurately, parts of a body, as opposed to a living, breathing person. But despite their efforts, law enforcement didn't manage to find a single shred of evidence that clued them into Lauren's condition or where she might be. The investigation dragged on for years without a break, and this is in spite of more than 3,000 tips called in from the general public. Then, on the morning of April 25, 2015, a hint of Lauren's fate was unearthed not far from where she went missing, yet it goes without saying that it was not a good one. The lifeless corpse of a University of Indiana student, Hannah Wilson, was discovered in neighboring Brown County. She was last seen getting into a taxi in front of the very same bar that Lauren had visited on the night of her disappearance. Lying on the ground near her body was a cell phone, one that police determined was owned by a local 50-year-old man by the name of Daniel Messel. He was arrested, tried, and convicted of Hannah's murder, and police deduced that he might well be the same person responsible for Lauren Spearer's disappearance too. However, in July of that same year, nationally renowned private investigator Bo Deedle concluded that after his own extensive investigation, he'd found nothing to seriously link Hannah's murder to Lauren's apparent abduction, and any similarities were purely coincidental. Yet right when it seemed that all hope was lost, the winter that followed Hannah Wilson's murder saw the FBI pursue its first serious lead. In the early hours of January 28, 2016, FBI agents were assisted by local law enforcement in serving a search warrant to a property in the 2900 block of Old Morgantown Road in Martinsville, approximately 20 miles north of Bloomington. The rather dry official statement from law enforcement was that they were following up on leads and tips in Morgan County regarding the disappearance of Lauren Spearer. 
but in reality, they had strong suspicions that a man named Justin Wagers was responsible for her murder or abduction. Wagers, who lived with his mother and stepfather, had been named and identified on multiple occasions as having exposed himself to local women during incidents that were characterized by aggressive and generally terrifying displays of depravity. Cops let cadaver dogs loose in the Wagers' home and found that they indicated for human remains in a nearby barn. However, after conducting a dig and sifting dirt from the floor of the structure, investigators found zero evidence of anyone having been buried there. As the years went by, Lauren's parents sadly announced that they believed their daughter to be deceased. Yet they've also been very open about their suspicions that someone very close to her may have been involved in her disappearance. Not only have they wondered aloud if someone might have slipped something in her drink while she was at Kilroy's, they also had no qualms with casting suspicion on the men she was with that night. Lauren's boyfriend at the time, Jesse Wolf, has also professed his distrust of Corey Rossman, Michael Beth, and Jay Rosenbaum, as not only did all three refuse to take police-issued polygraph tests, but all three lawyered up in the days following her disappearance, apparently completely unprompted to do so, as she was still considered very much alive at that time. Rossman, Beth, and Rosenbaum then publicly stated that they had passed privately administered polygraph tests, which apparently proved their innocence. They were also completely unapologetic regarding them hiring attorneys, and stated that their refusal to cooperate with Bloomington police was down to them not trusting law enforcement. A theory was batted around that Lauren may have died as a result of a drug overdose, one resulting from narcotics obtained from either Rossman, Beth, or Rosenbaum. If that was the case, it's plausible that all three or a combination of the men could have conspired to dispose of her body so that their guilt would never be suspected. Obviously, hiring lawyers and refusing to take a polygraph doesn't exactly make the three guys look good. But in all fairness, it's highly inadvisable to talk to police officers without a lawyer present especially since all three guys knew well their friend was missing. What's more, polygraphs are so unreliable that they're no longer admissible in court, and the police were most likely just looking to get the three guys in an interview room so they could browbeat them into incriminating themselves. So, in light of that, we have to consider other options. But having exhausted the possibilities of either Daniel Messel or Justin Wager having killed her, Time and time again we're forced to consider the accidental overdose angle. I truly don't think it was a random abduction. I think that somebody that Lauren knew was responsible for the events of that evening, her mother publicly stated in 2014. And she may well be correct. Statistically, most people are murdered by someone they know, sometimes pretty intimately too. And it doesn't seem out of the question that those three young men with big bright futures ahead of them wouldn't want to throw them away by admitting they'd given a girl too much to drink or too much of something a little less than legal. So as much as people focus on stranger danger, or of that random creeper who becomes the source of their untimely demise, maybe people should start looking a little closer to home, to those who profess to love or care for us, who might actually disappear us, dispose of our body, or bury our names, just to protect themselves. On the morning of Tuesday, September 20th of 1988, 19-year-old Tara Calico left her home in Bellin, New Mexico to begin her daily bike ride along New Mexico State Road. Cycling was her favorite form of exercise, and she chose a route she'd ridden every morning, without fail, for years by that point, and was often accompanied by her mother, Patty Dole. However, in recent weeks, Patty had ceased to join her daughter in her daily rides after one particularly frightening incident in which she believed the pair had been stalked by an angry motorist. Patty had implored her daughter to stop cycling at that time in the morning, or to at least take a different route, but her daughter rejected the idea and said her mother was overreacting when it was suggested that she carry mace. That Tuesday morning, Tara had noticed one of her hamstrings feeling a little tight. 
She mentioned this to her mother and added that if she wasn't home by 12, it was because she was probably injured. In which case, her mother was to drive down the regular route to give her and her bike a ride back. We can also assume that Tara desperately wanted to be back around that time, as she had a date at around 12.30 and wanted time to get ready. And indeed, when Tara failed to return by noon, Patty drove down their usual cycling route, but couldn't locate her daughter. But what she did find were the broken pieces of what was unmistakably Tara's Sony Walkman. Patty immediately contacted the police, suggesting the broken pieces might represent some kind of trail for them to follow. Police did indeed follow the trail of broken plastic, but to no avail. Several witnesses were interviewed, each saying they had seen Tara riding her bike along the state road. One or two even added that they had noticed a light-colored pickup truck following closely behind her, but hadn't really thought anything of it at the time. Police cast a wide net in the search that followed, but not a single trace of Tara or her bicycle could be found. It was as if those she'd ridden into a black hole, like she just dropped off the face of the earth. Yet little did they know, they would be seeing Tara again. Only the circumstances in which they'd see her would be truly terrifying. On the evening of June 15th, 1989, a woman in Port St. Joe, Florida, stopped at a local convenience store. She pulled into a free parking space next to a large white windowless Toyota cargo van, and as she got out, noted that it was being driven by a mustachioed Caucasian man who appeared to be in his 30s. She then walked into the store, picked up a few choice items, and headed back out to her vehicle. The Toyota cargo van was gone, but lying in the empty parking spot was a small square Polaroid photograph. At first glance, the picture appeared to be of two people lying among some bedding, but on further inspection, the contents of the photograph made the woman's blood run cold. It showed a young boy of maybe only seven or eight, along with a young woman in her late teens. Each appeared to have their wrists bound behind their backs with a strip of duct tape covering each of their mouths. She immediately contacted local law enforcement, who in turn set up roadblocks to intercept the vehicle, but the van was never found and the driver never identified. Representatives from the Polaroid company offered to analyze the picture before informing police that the picture could have been taken no earlier than May of 1989, as the kind of material used to print the photo was not available until then. The Polaroid's discovery sparked a frenzy of interest in the national media, and Patty Dole was contacted by friends who believed the gagged girl looked an awful lot like Tara. The FBI then brought the photograph to Patty, who was then on convinced that the girl in the picture was her missing daughter. She cited the scar on the bound girl's leg, one that was identical to one Tara had received as a result of a car accident. Patty also noticed that a paperback copy of V.C. Andrews' novel My Sweet Adrena can be seen lying next to the girl, a book that just so happened to be Tara's all-time favorite. The United Kingdom's Scotland Yard analyzed the photo and conclusively agreed that the woman in the picture was indeed Tara, but a follow-up analysis by the Los Alamos National Laboratory disagreed, citing differences in the girl's facial structure. However, when the FBI conducted a third analysis of the photo, the results were inconclusive. They were 75% sure it was her, just enough to officially declare it as it might muddy or misdirect any potential investigation. The other young person in the picture was thought to be young Michael Henley, also of New Mexico, who had disappeared just a few months before Tara had. Michael's mother said that she too was almost certain that it was her young son tied up in the Polaroid. Yet this is considered highly unlikely as Michael's remains were discovered in June 1990 in the Zuni Mountains, less than 10 miles from the family's campsite he vanished from. Police believe that Michael simply wandered off and subsequently died of exposure, and if that were the case, there was no way the child in the van could be him. Two other possible Polaroid photographs of Tara had surfaced in the years since her disappearance, the first being discovered near a construction site in the small town of Montecito, California. 
It is a blurry photo of a girl's face, with tape covering her mouth and light blue striped fabric behind her. Many have noted the blatant similarities between the fabric to that on the pillow in the Toyota van photo. It was taken on film that was not available until June 1989. The second Polaroid depicts a woman loosely bound in gauze. Her eyes are covered with yet more gauze and large black frame glasses, and she's standing with a male passenger beside her on an abandoned AMRAC train. The film used was not available until February 1990. Calico's mother believed the first was definitely Tara, with her sister saying that the two girls had a striking, uncalming resemblance. As for me, I will not rule them out, but keep in mind our family has had to identify many other photographs and all but those three were ruled out. Many years went by without any arrests or developments in the case. Then, in 2008, rumors spread that two teenage boys had accidentally hit Calico with a truck, panicked and subsequently killed her, covering up their misdeeds by disposing of her corpse somewhere it had never be found. But this was dismissed as pure hearsay and the police officer who made the comment was publicly chastised by Tara's stepfather for them. Five more years went by and we could be forgiven for thinking that Tara's case would remain a cold one. But in 2013, the FBI announced that they had set up a six-person task force that was to be charged with reinvestigating Tara's abduction, citing the discovery of new evidence. Then in 2019, the FBI followed up their announcement by offering a reward of up to $20,000 for precise details leading to the identification or location of Tara Lee Calico and information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for her disappearance. So it seems the FBI are creeping ever closer to finding the person responsible for Tara's death or abduction. And then even if 30 years goes by, the powers that be will not simply allow people to go missing without doing something about it. But the question remains, was it really a freak car accident that killed Tara? One in which a terrified teen found he couldn't face the consequences? Or was Tara kidnapped by someone with much more nefarious intentions? Someone who wanted to show off his monstrous labors by displaying his quarry, bound and gagged, his playthings until he saw fit to dispose of them? But at the end of the day, we're only left to wonder in horror at Tara's fate at the hands of her captor, left only to pray that the same thing doesn't happen to us or any of our loved ones. Daphne Westbrook's upbringing wasn't one we would call easy. In 2011, when she was just seven years old, her parents John and Rona went through some of the most bitterly nasty and spiteful divorce proceedings one can imagine. Rona began petitioning the court of Hamilton County, Tennessee for primary custody of Daphne in March of 2016. A judge then ruled in her favor, stating that John would only have custody of Daphne every other weekend, as well as ordering him to pay a substantial amount in child support. Rona added that her daughter started to thrive when she received primary custody, adding that she became more outgoing, got her first job, and generally seemed more happy. On top of that, her performance at Chattanooga State Collegiate High dramatically improved, and soon Daphne envisioned herself graduating with both her high school diploma and an associate's degree. Then, on October of 2019, Daphne went over to Chattanooga to spend the weekend with her father. Two days later, Daphne told her mom that she may be arriving home a little later than usual, as she and a friend wanted to take her father's dog for a walk. Her mother agreed, but Daphne failed to return home. Rona immediately called all of the friends of Daphne's that she had contact details for, but none seemed to have made any plans with her. Unable to get her daughter on the phone, Rona panicked and reported her missing. She didn't hear back from her daughter for two days, and when she called... Daphne seemed angry that her mother had filed a police report. She stated emphatically that she wasn't missing, but as Rona tried to reason with her, Daphne hung up the phone. It was a week before Rona and Daphne spoke again. As soon as Daphne answered her phone, Rona noticed that she was talking in a strange tone of voice. 
and when her mother asked her where she was, Daphne flat out refused to say. Rona then asked who Daphne was with, but again, she completely refused to reveal any other information other than she was okay. When Rona pressed her for more details, Daphne hung up the phone. As you can imagine, Rona was absolutely terrified for her daughter's well-being and actively began scouring social media for any clues of Daphne's whereabouts, be it mentions from friends, check-ins, or recently posted photographs. It's believed that these efforts, along with posting comments which inquired about Daphne's location, caused someone to send a short video to Rona. Yet instead of giving her any solid answers, the video did nothing but terrify Rona, along with raising many questions as to what in God's name was going on. The video is shot in almost complete darkness, so much so that Rona began to question if the girl in the video was even her daughter to begin with. Moments after she'd watched the clip, the anonymous sender of the video message suddenly deleted it, and to this day it's not clear who exactly sent it, be it Daphne's father, a third party, or even Daphne herself. Preliminary investigations led both police and Daphne's immediate family to believe she had simply run away from home. It was common knowledge that she'd struggled with mental illness and that she'd not responded well to the news of her father's work-related departure for Colorado. After confessing to having thoughts of taking her own life in the same year she disappeared, Daphne's depression had been treated with medication and she was beginning to show signs of improvement. However, Rona mentioned that her ex-husband had been extremely critical of the decision to medicate Daphne and had forbidden her from seeing a doctor or taking her pills whenever she was in his custody. Detectives believe that denying her access to her meds was partially to blame for any apparent decline in Daphne's physical or emotional state, further emphasizing the need to find her and bring her home. Her mother, stepfather, and grandparents pleaded for her to reach out and let them know she was safe, but to no avail. Neither Daphne or her father ever tried to reach out to them again. As for Daphne's father, John Westbrook, it was initially speculated that he had nothing to do with his daughter's disappearance, as he actually cooperated with police for a brief time around the beginning of 2020. Even Daphne's maternal grandparents seemed satisfied that John wasn't to blame, and it seemed he'd at least made an effort to play the concerned and loving father. Yet it soon became obvious that John was lying, and after his immediate family members demanded that he cut the nonsense and bring his daughter back to them, John simply dropped off the face of the earth. By June of 2020, he had officially been charged with custodial interference, but it's clear that John had no intention of facing these charges as, around the same time they were filed, animal shelter records from Albuquerque, New Mexico showed John had stopped by to pick up one of Daphne's dogs, which had apparently gotten loose at some point during their journey. This was all the confirmation that law enforcement needed to conclude that Daphne was most probably in the company of her father, as there was no way she'd have allowed herself to part with her dogs. It was just a case of tracking them down. Yet unless they could be sure that she was being held against her will, all of law enforcement's efforts would be in vain, but it wasn't difficult to make a case for her abduction. Daphne wasn't always the happiest of girls, but she was tight with her close-knit circle of friends. In the custody of her mom, Daphne was constantly back and forth with her girlfriends using various social media apps, but in the company of her father, her communication became sporadic and increasingly melancholy. What's more, law enforcement began to piece together a picture of Daphne's father, a man who was far more dangerous and ruthless than they could have possibly imagined. John Westbrook made his living in IT, specifically in the field of cybersecurity. He was also very well versed in Bitcoin and blockchain technology in general, and police believed he was using his expertise to conceal his movements. Since the father and daughter were so difficult to reach on their cell phones, law enforcement deducted that their cell phones were virtually always wrapped in aluminum foil to prevent incoming and outgoing calls. They also assumed that John was either denying his daughter the use of her laptop or at least installed applications that essentially made her invisible online. There was also no danger of John running out of money, and being forced into a mistake that way, as it was determined that he had not only invested sizable amount of money in Bitcoin, but he was able to work small IT jobs on the fly. And what little information the cops were able to obtain 
only served to make John Westbrook seem like an even more intimidating figure. In the time since he disappeared, the cops estimated John to have used at least 15 different email addresses, 10 ID cards with varying pseudonyms, and at least three different vehicles. It also became apparent that John purchased hair dye and a set of false teeth, leading police to believe that he may have developed an elaborate disguise in order to avoid capture. The situation wasn't looking good. Law enforcement knew that they were dealing with a shrewd and resourceful man who could very well remain one step ahead of them at all times. They couldn't shut down his assets. They couldn't trace him online. For all intents and purposes, he was a phantom, one they'd have to rely on lost dogs to catch. We've contacted the Interpol Crimes Against Children unit and it's impossible to trace what he's doing, said a member of the Hamilton County District Attorney's Office. Yet perhaps most disturbing of all, the DA went on to allege that John Westbrook was actually drugging his daughter to prevent her escape. We believe Daphne has this odd affection to him now because prior to her disappearance, John would give her alcohol, marijuana, LSD, and mushrooms. And he's now, we know from recent witness interviews, that she's constantly drugged and or drinking alcohol provided by him. Shortly after the disappearance at the Albuquerque dog shelter, John and Daphne went dark and didn't resurface until February of 2021, when a Bible belonging to Daphne was found discarded in a garbage can outside of a Trader Joe's outlet in Santa Fe. Police believed that they were closing in on the pair, but it appears they acted too hastily, as Daphne then found a way to contact a friend to say that they were on the move again, but that she wanted to take her own life. This gave the apparent abduction a new sense of urgency, and on February of 2021, John was charged with aggravated kidnapping and flagrant non-support. The FBI went public for the first time, releasing statements that Daphne was in danger and asking the citizens of Colorado and New Mexico to keep their eyes peeled. Due to the increase in media attention, there were several reported sightings in places like Gunnison, Colorado, Seattle, Washington, and Tampa, Florida but nothing that could be confirmed as concrete fact. Yet slowly but surely, more and more reports came in from Florida, phoned in by people convinced that they just sighted Daphne and John Westbrook. There was one from Fort Walton Beach on March 6th, and another from Sebring just a few days later. It's then that authorities discovered a relative of John's named Starla just so happened to live in Sebring, Florida. So sometime during the week of March 5th, Authorities executed a search warrant at Starla's home and seized all of her electronics. Each device was analyzed but not a single shred of evidence could be found, and once again, all Rona could do was pray for her daughter's safe return. She's been taken away from everyone she knew, her friends, everything, all just gone, vanished, Rona said. And I don't have enough words for that. The things that we have learned are very scary and very disturbing. We're just so eager to find her and so that we can help. Then on May 28th of 2021, the Amber Alert regarding Daphne's abduction was cancelled. But unlike so many cases where the story ends with finding a dead body, a now 18-year-old Daphne Westbrook was found safe and sound in Sampson, Alabama, only nine miles away from Florida state lines. Although it's not clear what condition the young girl is in, we can be thankful that she turned up alive in a world where so many abductees do not. Hamilton County District Attorney's Office released a statement on Facebook which read, We are thankful Daphne is safe and no longer being held by her father. It is especially gratifying to be able to tell her mom that Daphne is free and no longer being hidden, but this doesn't change our goal to find and prosecute John Westbrook. Our investigations remain active and we expect new developments within the next couple of weeks. It'll be interesting to see just how this case unfolds over the next year or so, if John Westbrook will or even can be caught. And if he is, how in God's name is he going to justify giving his teenage daughter hallucinogenic drugs? Was it a way to control her depression without conventional medication? Or was it simply a dangerous and nefarious way to control a person he believed belonged to him? Did love push a father to protect his daughter in some pretty unconventional ways? Or did that love become twisted up until he could justify just about any maltreatment in order to keep her to himself?
In the early hours of June 25, 1986, a Volvo F12 cargo truck carrying pure sulfuric acid raced through the Somo Sierra mountain pass near the Spanish capital of Madrid. It began overtaking other vehicles at alarming speeds, and in one case passed so close to a car that it smashed a side mirror clean off. It then appeared as if the Volvo was attempting to pass another truck, but instead, it swerved at the last second, smashing the unsuspecting truck completely off the road. Suddenly, the Volvo veered into the path of oncoming traffic at speeds of up to 87 miles per hour, colliding with another truck with such force that both vehicles were violently overturned. The impact had been so destructive that it had ruptured the cargo hold of the Volvo F12, sending a wave of pure sulfuric acid washing over the surrounding highway. As rescue workers poured sand and lime onto the acid to neutralize it, they were also greeted by the sight of a man and woman. Both were naked, bald, and sitting motionless in the cab of the first truck. Each had been completely bathed in the highly concentrated chemical substance in the moments immediately following the crash, and the results were about as horrifying as you can imagine. Their clothes and hair had been the first things to be dissolved, and acid was well into the process of burning and dissolving their flesh. They had no doubt died in complete agony and the damage to both their bodies and the interior of the truck made identifying them extremely difficult. They were eventually identified as Andreas Martinez and his wife Carmen Gomez, and authorities contacted Carmen's mother to inform her of Carmen's tragic demise. Her response was chilling. But what about the boy? Please tell me my grandson is okay. The boy she was referring to was 10-year-old Juan Pedro, Andreas and Carmen's only child. He too had occasionally joined his mother and father on their shorter trucking journeys, but never one that long. Yet examination of the truck's cab revealed a number of children's cassette tapes, along with several items of the child's clothing in the back. Some were heavily corroded, but it was clear which age group they were intended for, yet there was absolutely no trace of young Juan in the cab of the truck. Once it had become clear that the body of a young boy was missing, residents of nearby villages and towns descended onto the crash site and began digging through the sand and lime in the hopes of uncovering Juan's body. They also searched the crags and crannies of the Somo Sierra Pass, but not a single trace of young Juan was to be found. While some believe that Juan was completely dissolved by the sulfuric acid, Chemists maintain that there is no way that the acid could have dissolved his body that quickly, and that if it had, there'd at least be extensive skeletal remains left behind. However, expert chemists did suggest that it might have been possible for one of the past's rock formations to act as a kind of bathtub, collecting enough acid to form a pool that Juan's body just so happened to have been thrown into. It seemed like an unspeakably ghastly twist of fate, but it was very possible and if it was indeed the case, it would have taken no longer than 24 hours for all soft tissue to dissolve. It would take another five days for Juan's bones to be reduced to mere fragments. Yet it would still be possible to recover nails, teeth, and certain items of clothing made of polypropylene. Detectives scoured the surrounding hills for any sign of such a bathtub rock formation, but nothing satisfying such criteria was discovered. And so the question remained... If Juan had been in the truck at the time of the crash, where was he now? Detectives began to study the truck's tachometer and found the device showed that the couple had made 12 short stops during the ascension of the Somo Sierra Pass. Truckers that usually drive that route say that they usually make one stop at most, aside from mechanical problems, and couldn't think of a reason why a person might stop twice, let alone 12 times. It's also been established that there was no traffic jam that would explain the odd stops. An analysis of the truck showed that the brakes were not damaged, meaning each stop was entirely deliberate. And this is where the story gets deeply disturbing. Remember the trucker who was run off the road by the speeding Volvo? He gave a statement to the police saying that, after he'd managed to gain control of his vehicle, he climbed out of the cab only to be greeted by a man and a woman with bright blue eyes and golden blonde hair. The woman spoke Spanish well, but did so with a rather distinctive Germanic inflection, 
as she told the startled trucker not to worry and that she and her colleague were medical professionals. The trucker allowed the couple to check his injuries but found that they soon moved on to the acid-washed crash site where he watched them retrieve some kind of package from the wreckage. After that, they climbed back into a small white windowless van and drove away. It is now believed that this package was the body of young Juan Pedro Martinez. It's not clear if the boy was alive or dead when these strange Nordic-looking medical professionals pulled him from the truck's obliterated cab. It's also unclear just who exactly they were and how they seemed to know that there would be a crash that day. Spanish police were unable to locate any such individuals, and Juan Pedro's disappearance remains a hauntingly perplexing mystery right up until today. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just a dollar a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.